of the Arsh of Allah. They hold the Arsh of Allah, their heads are at the seventh sky and their feet are below us. They span the entire, they're like pillars. They're holding up the Arsh of Allah. So these, the only reason I'm explaining is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Rabb over everything and everyone. Just like Rasul Allah is the messenger for everyone, including the jinns, humans, and angels. Yes. Um, I forgot which name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it was. Yes. But one of them, I think it was al Muhmin. Okay. The, oh, or it was Al-Malik, but one, it means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the master or the... Al-Malik. Yeah, Al-Malik. Yes. The king of all kings. Good. The king of all kings. So, Rasulullah is our messenger just like he's the messenger for everyone. Correct? Do you have something to say? Aren't there like 70,000 angels holding the arsh? No. 70,000 angels at any time. Do you know what the Kaaba is? What is the Kaaba? Yes. The house, yes. the house of Allah. So Allah lives in it, yes? Yes. No. No. Yes. Like, yes. Yes or no, guys? Yes. Somebody say yes. Somebody say yes. Yes. So it's just like a symbol. It's a what? It's a symbol. To symbolize. But Allah doesn't live in that house. It's just a symbol. Allah is everywhere. Right? Allah is everywhere. So, right how we humans have that Kaaba, the angels have a Kaaba as well. That's called the Baytul Ma'mur. That's on the seventh sky. Every second, 70,000 angels come, they do one tawaf, meaning they circle around it once. Those angels will never get a turn again to do tawaf around it. That's the number of, the, until the day of judgment. This will continue until the day of judgment. So that's how many angels there are in the entire creation of Allah. Everyone good? Everyone following? So, to summarize, we are Muslims, correct? And we follow Islam. So I'm going to ask a very interesting question that some of you hinted on, hinted on early, earlier. Are we humans first? Or are we Muslims first? Yes. Your classes are how many? Yes. Muslims? You're Muslims first. Okay, vote. Who thinks they're a Muslim before being a human being? And who thinks you're a human being? Don't get peer pressure. Stick to what your conviction is. Yeah. And who thinks you're a human being and then a Muslim? Because you have to be born to become a Muslim. Anyone? Anyone? So Musa only? And two, what was your name? Uh, Ibrahim. Ibrahim. So Ibrahim and Musa, what was your name? Aima. Aima. So three people. What came first, human beings or Islam? Is Islam. Yes. Islam. So what are you first, Muslim or human beings? Muslim. 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 So now when everyone asks you, you should know the answer. That why are you a Muslim first? Because Islam was before human beings. Islam was before human beings. Very good. Very interesting story now, okay? Very interesting. And this is about a book. This is in a book called Sahih Bukhari. There is a, there is a tribe that's called the Banu Quraysh. It's like a place. You know, in GTA, there's Mississauga. Just like back then, 1400 years ago, Medina al Munawwara was like the GTA. It was like a big city. And within them, there were smaller cities called Banu Quraza, one of them. And we had just won, the Muslims had just won, the Battle of Khandaq, the Battle of the Trench. We had just won, Muslims had dug a trench, it was like a whole warfare. Muslims, Alhamdulillah, won. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, meet me at Banu Quraza and we will read Salatul Asr there. And we will read Salatul Asr there. And he left with the quicker companions on horses. Now these are the older companions, the slower companions and the camels. Camels are slower than horses. And they have armor and they have digging tools, they're coming slowly. When all of a sudden it's time for Asr. And then the time of Asr begins to pass them by. What comes after Asr? Maghrib. So now Maghrib is about to come. The companions get into an ikhtilaf, it's called. It's called a disagreement. It's time for Asr, let's pray. But some of them said, wait a second. Rasulullah said, don't pray until you get to Banu Quraza. 
So some of them said, you know what, we're going to listen to Rasulullah, we're going to go to Banu Quraza. The other people said, but Allah is bigger. But Allah is bigger. So we should listen to Allah. Allah says, read namaz at its prime time, the moment it's time to pray. So we should pray then. So they split into two. Then some of them prayed there, some of them went back to Banu Quraza. Now, by vote of hand, who, if you lived 1400 years ago, who would have stayed in, their, in that tribe right there and prayed Salatul Asr to follow the commandment of Allah? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. And who would have listened to Rasulullah? And it doesn't matter if the Salah is delayed, they would have prayed in Banu Quraza. One, two, three, three and a half. Okay, so it's about five to three. The rest, what about the rest of you? No opinion? Not sure? Okay. Next day comes. What happens when you get into a disagreement? Who's brother and sister here? Right. So what happens when you get into a disagreement? Somebody has to win. Yeah. Correct? Yes. Somebody has to win. Yes. So what did the companion say the next day? I was right, you were wrong. I was right, you were wrong. They were saying, I believe in Allah first. I'm, I'm a better Muslim than you because I listen to Allah. The other people said, no, no, wait a second. I believe in Rasulullah because I heard him say, so I will follow him. So then what do you do when you get into a disagreement and you start to hit each other? Where do you go? Or who comes to you? Your parents. What are you doing? Similarly, they went to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying, Rasulullah, the, the companions are beginning to fight. Who's right? The people who listen to Allah or the people that listen to you? Rasulullah, he looks at them and he smiles. Subhanallah. And he says, both of you are right. And he says, both of you are right. That means that Islam is a religion of tolerance and peace. We understand that people have differences of opinion. Speaking of differences of opinion, there were two companions. What are companions called in Arabic? Everyone, I'm pretty sure most of you know this, yes. Sahaba. Sahaba, very good. So two Sahabi, two Sahaba, they get into a disagreement with each other. One of their names is a very, he's a prankster. He's a comedian. He's the one, he's known in today's terminology, a class clown. His name is Hazrat No'man. Hazrat No'man is beginning and he's talking with someone and No'man is losing the, dis losing the argument. So what happens when you lose an argument and you know you're losing? Well, you have to get the final word in, so what do you say? Huh? It's too late now. Something along the lines of, I know what he said, something along the lines of, I'll see about you. I'll see about you. See what I do. See what I do. Let me, let me, I'll get back to you. So then, as a Noman, he walks away, losing temporarily the, uh, the uh, argument. He goes, there's a new tribe in town. And what they specialize in, back in the day, they used to sell and buy slaves. So Noman goes up to them and says, I have this individual in Medina who's my slave and I wish to sell him to you. And he's exceptional and he's tall and he's handsome and he's smart and he's strong. And they say, and he's very cheap. So the people say, wait, if you're, for example, if you're gonna be selling something and you're selling it for so cheap, there's gotta be something wrong with it. So what's wrong with it? So Hazrat Noman, he says, he has only one flaw, is when you can go capture him, he's gonna pretend that he's free. He's gonna say, I'm free, I'm free. But don't listen to him. He's a little messed up in the head. He's a little messed up. Some of you might be following along with what's about to happen. So Noman, he says, pay me now. And there's that companion over there, the companion who was having an argument with, the disagreement with, go. That's my slave, capture him. But don't listen to him when he says, I'm free. So a bunch of them get together, they grab their nets, and they go behind him, filled Medina, and they throw the net over him. The guy, of course, Sahabi, is looking around like, what are you doing? He's like, we've already paid for you to your owner, and you are our property now. So what does the Sahabi says? I am free, I am free. The captors, the masters now, they say, 
oh, we know about this flaw of yours. We know you're a little crazy. We know that you're a slave. So then they begin to drag this poor Sahabi out of Medina to go back to their own city. As they're going, this poor Sahabi is like, someone tell my wife, someone tell my children, someone call my brother. Eventually one of the companions, he sees that this is a noble of Medina. Why is he being dragged? He goes running to Rasulullah. Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa look at what's happened, look at what's happened, look at what happened. Rasulullah, he smiles and he says, this seems like the trick of Noman. <coughs> Bring Noman to me. <laughs> Noman is brought, Rasulullah says, Noman, what have you done this time? But Noman says to Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, I don't know why your companions mess with me. They're not as clever as me. So Rasulullah, he says, Noman, quickly go, right the wrong and give the companions some dates as compensation. What does this mean? This story illustrates the forgiving nature and the fact that you guys should have fun with each other. But not to the point where the Sahabi was being dragged. That was a bit much. Okay, you don't want to sell your brother and sister on the slave market. That's not what I'm trying to say to you. Alright? So one final thing inshallah and then we'll end. Okay, this is about Rasulullah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is a, also a very interesting story. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was walking one day. Okay? And he's walking and he sees an elder. Who has grandparents here? Everyone, okay. And you've seen them, you've met with them. Correct? All of you. Grandparents, when you speak with them a little bit, they seem in their own world. Right? They seem like they're, they're above, they're, they're with Allah. Like, you know, they don't really care. They're, they just get food, they're happy, they don't care about money. Everything is, you know, they're content. You know, they're content. So, this elder companion was sitting in an alleyway in Medina. This alleyway in Medina was reserved for women. The only women crossed there because it was really narrow. Even men, because men are a little bigger than women, they can't pass through because it's so narrow. And this poor elderly companion was just sitting there and he's you know, lost in his thoughts. Sometimes your grandparents are lost in their thoughts. You know, in the prayer mat, they're doing, they're crying, they're praying to Allah. The Surah happens to walk by. And he sees that my elder companion is sitting in an alleyway reserved for women. Just to put that into your terminology, it would be like your parents seeing one of the brothers enter a female washroom. All hell would break loose. First of all, there would be questions about identity. Which gender are you? Is everything okay? They'd probably take you to all the imams that they know to make sure your head is okay, teach you about Islam. So Rasulullah went also got into Jalal. What is my companion doing in a street reserved for women? So Rasulullah he says quickly in Jalal, he gets a little bit angry. Oh my companion, why are you seated in there? What happens when your parents catch you when you do something wrong? Sorry? They get angry. They get angry, right? But what you get angry or when your parents get mad at you, what do you do? You give justification. <laughs> oh no, I wasn't actually there. No, no, I was that wasn't me. That was somebody else, somebody that looked like me. That wasn't Musa, that was Ibrahim. That wasn't me. So your mom was over there. So So what happens is this companion says something similar. He says Oh, Ya Rasulullah, I was looking for my camel. <laughs> and then he holds his head. I don't own a camel. <laughs> Everyone in Medina knows this. Rasulullah realizes that the companion is ashamed and embarrassed. So Rasulullah smiles and he says to this companion, Tell me when you find your camel. And he walks away. <laughs> and he walks away. Now, every time this companion would see Rasulullah, they would say, Salam. And they would ask, Rasulullah would ask this companion, have you found your camel? Allah. And the companion knew, all of his friends knew, all of his children knew that he didn't have a camel. So he'd get embarrassed and ashamed. Example, if you were caught doing something wrong and you say, yeah, it was because I was trying to buy a Lamborghini. You'd be like, uh, that's clearly a lie. You'd be, you know, you'd be embarrassed. Why did I even say that? Why did I even make, why did my brain come up with those words? So this companion became more and more and more and more ashamed, so much so that he stopped coming to Masjid al nabi because he didn't want to see him, he didn't want to get embarrassed. One day he really misses Masjid al nabi He scouts around, he hears that Rasulullah has left for an expedition. 
He's left outside of Medina. So Rasul, he quickly goes, sneaks into Masjid al Nabi, and he begins to read his Nawaf. He begins to read his Namaz. As he's reading, he says, and he's the, he's the one who's originated this hadith, he says, I begin to smell Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then he's thinking, I'm praying Namaz, and I'm stuck. Because when I finish Namaz, Rasulullah would say salam, and he's going to ask me about my camel. So, what would you do if you know your parents are there, ready for the danda sota, <laughs> ready to hit you, but you're praying namaz? What would you do? This is what you. Uh, let me tell you what you would do. Alhamdulillahi <laughs> Rabbil Al, slowest namaz you've ever heard. And then you would go into ruku, you would do subhana rabbi al azim. You're supposed to read it how many times? Three. You're going to read it a hundred times. <laughs> Eventually, my parents will get tired and they will leave. This companion was doing exactly the same thing. The Sunnah came, sat down right beside him. And this companion is praying and he's praying and he's praying and he's praying. Eventually, namaz is finite. There's only so much Quran you can read, there's only so much tasbih you can do. Eventually, it has to end. So the last part of namaz is called tashahud. He sits in tashahud and he's coming to the end. What's at the end? Rabbi Jalni Muqim Salati, right? He's coming to the end and he's like, I have to say salam, I have to say salam, but I can't meet the Prophet. What should I do? He's like, This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to say, Assalamu alaikum, Assalamu alaikum. Quickly stand up and say Allahu Akbar again, and then I'll begin my next namaz. Okay? So this companion, he quickly stands up. He says, Assalamu alaikum, Assalamu alaikum, quickly stands up, Allah, and Rasulullah is there in the meantime. He says, Companion, oh my companion, oh my sahabi, today you can read a hundred namaz. I will meet with you today. I will meet with you today. So the companion is like this, and he puts his hand down defeated. I can't run away from Rasulullah now. I can't run away. He's going to stay there. He's going to stand there. So Rasulullah is there looks at him and he says, oh my companion, why don't you meet with me anymore? And this companion is ashamed. He can't even meet the gaze of Rasulullah looking down, embarrassed, ashamed. So Rasulullah grabs him, pulls him, yanks him towards him, gives him a big hug. And he whispers into his ear, oh my companion, I will never ask you about your camel again. This is the akhlaq of Rasulullah. This is the character of Rasulullah. There's a couple of lessons to be learned. The most logical example and lesson is this. If your parents are ever ready with a stick, go and read the bus. <laughs> they will forgive you. And if two doesn't work, read four. Four doesn't work, read six. Eventually they will get tired and they will care more that you're praying namaz than whatever you did wrong. Number two, it's okay to make mistakes knowing that you have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who will always Forgive you. Yes, question? Um, not a question, but I'm just going to state something. Yeah. In my school, um, I'm in an Islamic school, and they said the bigger the lie, um, if the lie is like a small lie, I mean, like say, oh, I was wrong, stuff like that, then, you know, you'll get a good view. But, but if the lie is a really, really big one, and then you say, okay, I was lying, then it's like you get a lot of good views. The bigger the lie, the more you ask for forgiveness from Allah, right? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, provided that you don't do it again, right? That the sincerity of repentance is very interesting. Musa, stand up. Stand up, stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. I, I, need, I need you over here. Okay. No, no, over here. I, you're going to be uh, my, you're going to be my, uh, my toy. Okay. No, no, no. All right. So Musa, over here. Rasulullah sallallahu one day was walking. All of a sudden, he sees an individual who, at that time, was called Rukana. So Musa, you're gonna be Rukana. Rukani. Okay. Rukana was like the John Cena of his time. Oh. Yeah. Oh. He was like the Kabi. He was like the Islam. What's his last name? Whatever his last name is. You know. Mike Tyson, he had won a hundred battles and he had never lost a single fight. He said that he could hold five horses with one hand. So Rukana was strong. So Rukana comes up to Rasulullah and he says, Are 
are you Muhammad? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah says, yes. He says, oh, you are the new so-called messenger. I don't believe you, but I will believe you if you can beat me in a wrestling match. So Rasulullah says, bring it. He says, bring it. Let's do it. Come on. So Rukana first is very surprised. Who dare messes with Rukana? And then Rukana, so I'm going to ask you to turn around towards me. And Rukana, well, how do you do? You're not going to punch me. No. <laughs> Rukana goes and he wants to grab Rasulullah. So he goes and he tries to grab the shirt of Rasulullah. Rasulullah grabs him with one hand. Grabs him with one hand. And using just this, you're going to be careful of this at the back. <laughs> okay, and then he quickly falls on the ground like this, like this. Rukana falls on the ground like this, and then quickly, and then quickly Rukana gets up, and Rukana says that wasn't fair. Rukana says that wasn't fair. It had just rained, and my foot slipped, and so I had fallen down. Let's go again. So Rukana a second time lunges. Rasulullah grabs him a second time. Flips it. <laughs> falls on the ground. Rukana quickly gets up a second time. He says, Whoa, 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 whoa. Some sand entered my eye. I couldn't see your hand. That wasn't fair. Let's do it a third time. So a third time Rukana comes. The Surullah grabs him, throws him down. But now Rukana is very slowly coming up. Very slow. Very slowly. Slowly, slowly man. Slowly. And then Rukana, he looks at him because he's not been flipped once. Not been flipped twice. Not you have an elder, elder brother? Yes. Who? Him. So you probably flipped him. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> oh. I have a, I have a younger brother. I flipped him many many times. Okay. So you know you can only flip someone so many times before they get really tired. So Rukana is now very tired. He stands up. He probably has tears in his eyes. Don't worry. Okay. Yeah, probably has tears in his eyes, and he says that is the most miraculous thing I have ever seen. Sit down. Everyone give a hand of applause to Musa. He has a career in acting. Okay, so Ghana, he says, that is the most miraculous thing I have ever seen. Rasulullah, he looks at him, smiles. And he says, you think that's a miracle? So Rukana, how do wrestlers, they, they, how do they call themselves in the third person? There's something more miraculous than beating Da Rukana? Then beating oh, Da Musa, <laughs> who could fight me? Who could beat me? This is a miracle on every miracle. So Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he looks at Rukana and he says, "Let me show you a real miracle." So there's a tree in the distance, and he says to the tree in the distance, "Ana Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam." I am Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The tree uproots itself, walks on its roots towards Rasulullah. Bends its bushes and says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasulu. I testify that there is no God but Allah, and Rasulullah is the last and the final messenger of Allah. Saying that, the tree then corrects itself, walks back, roots itself, and Rukana over there is like, what did I just see? <laughs> and then he says, Indeed, I believe that you are the Nabi of Allah and he accepts Islam. So we are, alhamdulillah, all Muslims and we're proud to be from the Ummah of Rasulullah. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Next few minutes, anyone have any 